Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you. I'm Gary Machuda, your host and sensei for the next hour, <clears throat> where we uh, explore the world of apologetics, explaining, defending the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence, where the rubber of catechesis meets the road of everyday life. And uh, as you know, on this program, I try to bring you the best of the best of Catholic apologetics. And today's guest is certainly within that ranks. We're going to have the raging Cajun Carlo Brissard join us this hour. And we're going to talk about uh, how to respond to challenging scripture posed by our Protestant friends. And he wrote a book. It's called Meet the Protestant Challenge, How to Answer 50 Biblical Objections to the Catholic Faith. We're going to go through the section on, or at least some of the section, on uh, scripture and tradition. You know, that's a, a hot topic because, uh, you know, uh, when Protestants read the Bible, they sometimes they don't find sacred tradition there in scripture. Sometimes they even find verses that seem to suggest uh, that Jesus was against tradition. Well, how do we answer that? Well, there, there simply is no better person out there in my humble opinion, to help us work through some of these passages than our good friend Carlo Broussard. So he's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. As always, we do our critical thinking skills every episode, and today's Finding the Fallacy, by the way, is the appeal to spite. And we meet an early church father who is Paulinus of Milan. So Paulinus of Milan. And... um Without further ado, why don't I give my shout outs and hat tips and, sh- you know, just all good stuff to those watching on social media, their live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Great to see familiar names. Yes, Carlo is an awesome Catholic apologist indeed, uh, George. And uh, I want to also welcome all of you listening on radio stations around the United States and around the world, perhaps via podcast through uh, our flagship uh, website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Or our handy-dandy phone app. I love the phone app. It's got tons of uh, really cool features that you don't see on a lot of other phone apps. Uh, just now you can access shows, but you can access past shows. You can send questions. You can access the prayers, things like that. If you don't have the phone app, grab it because it's free and it's good for you. Um, let's see. Also, if you have any questions for Carlo Broussard, give us a call toll-free at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151, and uh, love to hear from you. Uh, why don't we jump right into our uh, our exercises, shall we? Because there's a wonderful little quote that, God willing, I'll have enough time to read about St. Ambrose. So I definitely want to squeeze it in. Uh, it's just very touching. But let's begin with the finding of the fallacy. As you know, not all arguments are the same. Uh, sometimes they are defective in their form. That's called a formal fallacy. There's also informal fallacies. Today's uh, finding of the fallacy is one of those. It's appeal to spite. An appeal to spite is basically a fallacy when someone attempts to win favor for an argument by exploiting existing feelings of bitterness, spite in the opposing party. And in other words, it's an attempt to sway the audience emotionally by associating a hated figure, perhaps, with opposition to the person's argument. Uh, Appeal to spite, incredibly uh, popular in terms of you just run into it all over the place, especially in public forums, uh, especially in political debates, political ads. uh, You do find... um, I don't think you really find it as much in advertising, but you certainly find it in uh, debates, um, religious debates, unfortunately, where uh, a speaker will try to exploit 
bitter feelings, spite of like the opposition. For example, how many times have you heard a Protestant Catholic uh, debate where the Protestant during the opening or closing remarks will gives this eloquent sermon on uh, you know the burning of Jan Hus or you know things like that, bad popes. Um, and basically, what he's trying to do is he's trying to uh, engender. Uh, these bitter feelings, you know, these uh, emotions and direct them against the opponent's position. So the audience won't really consider their position. So it happens a lot. Really, the only thing you can do is point out that, uh, you know, in a way it's kind of um, uh, akin to the red herring argument or non sequitur. It's like, even if uh, there is bad feelings and stuff that doesn't change the question of whether or not the argument with the evidence is true or not. Right. Um, even if p- bad people may have espoused the particular belief, it doesn't mean that that particular belief is wrong. So, uh, that's kind of how you diffuse that argument. And that is our finding of the fallacy for today. The appeal to spite. So, uh, that is uh, our fallacy. Let's jump to the meet early church father, who is Paulinus of Milan, who was born or actually flourished sometime around AD 380, 420. And by the way, we get all our information for the meet the early church father segment from uh, Jurgen's faith of the early fathers. Uh, it's just, he has these really nice, pithy introductions that we more or less, uh, you know, base our, our information on. And Jurgen says that Paulinus was a cleric from Milan, a deacon, uh, but although Isidore Sibyl calls him a priest, it remains doubtful that he ever advanced beyond the diaconate. Uh, soon after 375 AD, uh, he received his clerical training in Milan. He served for a time as the secretary to a really great early church father who is St. Ambrose. And uh, after Ambrose's death on April 4th, 397 AD, Paulinus went to Africa, and there, under Augustine's influence, now, of course, remember Augustine, uh, uh, St. Ambrose was very influential in St. Augustine's uh, reversion to the Catholic faith, I guess you could say. And so uh, he, uh, there, under the influence of uh, Augustine, he began to write his Life of St. Ambrose. <coughs> His only other extent writing is the denunciation of Celestius, who was uh, addressed uh, from Carthage to Pope Zosimus on November 8th, uh, 417. You guys remember Celestius. We talked about him. He's Pelagian, um, who uh, came to uh, North Africa and eventually got condemned by the Pope for his Pelagianism. But anyway, his major work, uh, Paulinus of Milan, is his life of St. Ambrose. And Ambrose was always held in the greatest reverence by St. Augustine, who regarded him as the father of his conversion. And Augustine knew also a great bond of friendship that existed between Ambrose and Paulinus uh, and uh, their long years of association, which gave Paulinus a better knowledge of Ambrose than pretty much anyone else in the ancient world had. Consequently, upon meeting Paulinus in Africa, Augustine suggested to him, that he should write an account of the life of St. Ambrose. And Paulinus uh, protested of his own unworthiness and lack of ability. But nevertheless, he he acquiesced to uh, Augustine's request, and he penned the life of St. Ambrose. And, uh, in fact, uh, it is a very beautiful book. And I wanted to have a quote from St. Ambrose, because I think this is particularly touching. And this is one of the few sections that Jurgens quotes. But nevertheless, uh, I just thought it was beautiful. You know, if you can picture a pastor today acting like Ambrose, uh, that would just be amazing. And this is what Paulinus has to say about Ambrose. He said, Ambrose rejoiced also with those who rejoiced, and he wept with those who wept. For whenever anyone confessed his sins to him, he received penance. So he wept that his... uh, that he forced the, the penitent to weep, uh, for he considered that he himself was in a state similar to that of the penitent. But when the cases of crime were confessed to him, he spoke of it to none but the Lord alone, with him with whom he interceded. And thus he left a good example for later priests, 
to be intercessors with God rather than accusers among men. For even according to the apostle, love is to be confirmed in dealing with a person of this kind, for he has become his own accuser who does not wait but anticipates the accuser, and thus by conf- by confessing he lightens up his own sins, lest there, there have something that the adversary might accuse him of. And when I read that, I was really touched. If you can imagine going to a confessional and confessing your sins and having the priest weep so bitterly, you know, um, that you yourself are moved to tears while you're confessing your sins. Uh, what a beautiful picture of St. Ambrose. And also that uh, when crimes were confessed to him, Ambrose, well, of course, you know, honoring the seal of confession, would only intercede to God and he wouldn't accuse this person before men. And again, you know, that last part about uh, accusation, I thought was really profound as well, that it's really not up to us to accuse others of sin. We should be accusing ourselves. Why? Because in the confession, when we conf- when we uh, accuse ourselves of sin, we're taking away whatever the adversary will hold against us on the day of judgment. And so that's what Paulinus was saying at the very end of the paragraph, that Ambrose would anticipate, you know, uh, the acu- what the accuser would hold against him and confess him to God so, so that uh, when he... The judgment comes, the adversary basically wouldn't have anything left to accuse him of. And I think that's just great advice. And what a wonderful role model to follow, St. Ambrose. And uh, The Life of St. Ambrose was written by Paulinus of Milan, who is our Meet the Early Church Father for today. Uh, coming up on the other side of the break, Master Apologist Carlo Broussard's coming on. We're going to talk about answering objections to Scripture and tradition. So stay tuned. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies, featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Karstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14, 2020, at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today. For Adoramus at the Triduum. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, Call 888-526-2151. 
Here's Gary. And hey, welcome back, everybody. How do you answer scripture texts that Protestants will challenge us about, especially in the area of uh, scripture and tradition? Well, to help us uh, learn how to explain and offer some counter challenges, we have none other than Master Apologist Carlo Brassard coming into the dojo. Carl Brassard, as you know, is a native of uh, Crowley, uh, Louisiana. He is uh, more than a decade. He traveled around the country teaching apologetics, biblical studies, theology, and philosophy. Carla also publishes uh, many different articles on a variety of subjects for Catholic Answers magazine. He's a regular guest on Catholic Answers Live and also an active blogger at Catholic.com. And you can get all the great stuff that Carlo has at his website at carlobrassard.com. And Carlo, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Hey, Gary, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you. You know, the, the holidays gave me a chance to finish your book, Meeting the Protestant Challenge, How to Answer 50 Biblical Objections to the Catholic Beliefs. And here, for those watching live stream, you can see this on the uh, webcam and uh, Carlo, great book. Uh, Thanks, so Gary. Impressed. Yeah, just, uh, you know, the depth in, uh, man, you cover all the hot topic, all the big scripture uh, verses. Right. Uh, yeah, the, so, most, the most common ones that we're challenged with that many of our Protestant brothers and sisters think pose a problem to Catholic beliefs. And so we want to dispel those myths, right, and misconceptions and show that, no, these Bible passages do not pose a threat to our beliefs. They do not undermine our beliefs. Uh, or to state it differently, our Catholic beliefs do not contradict these Bible passages. And then also, too, to go on the positive, on the offensive, and provide some positive biblical evidence for the beliefs that are under discussion in each chapter. Yeah, and it's not just, folks, it's not just, you know, here's a verse and here's a paragraph of what to say. Uh, you know, Carl, you do such a great job breaking down, like, the major premises, uh, you know, walking through uh, whether their argument holds together. And then right. and at the end, you kind of come back with these uh, counter examples as, or counter char challenges. Yeah, a counter challenge, just a question or two that you can pose to your Protestant friend after you walk through the various steps of meeting the challenge, showing that the challenge has no force, giving the positive evidence, and then ask a question or two to get the Protestant to think about what you've just said, but you know, more importantly, to think about their belief that is presupposed, by, um, that the challenge presupposes, and begin to see the flaws and the cracks in their reasoning. Yeah, that's really, for me, that's the gold standard. If you could just get people to kind of reconsider or think through their own arguments. Uh, right. That's really the key where lots of good things happen. Amen. Amen. Because uh, you begin, you, it's important to expose where the flaws are, where the cracks are in the foundation, and then to push on those cracks a little bit uh, with, with the person uh, that you're talking to in order for them to begin to see that uh, their reasoning is flawed and to reconsider it. And, and, and of course, we always want to couch this within the framework of love. It's not just to get the Protestant to squirm and to realize, oh, no, my belief is wrong, you're right. Uh, I mean, that's definitely a part of it. But it's ultimately to get them to come to see the fullness of the picture of God's revelation and the way Jesus has offered to us from the Father. Because we care enough, we love God enough that we care about his revelation, and we want to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, today's subject, we're going to talk about Scripture and tradition. And before yeah. I go to uh, some uh, challenging Bible verses— uh, I always thought of this subject as a kind of dangerous subject. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this hmm. in that, uh, you know, if a, a Protestant's a, a Bible only Christian and the scripture is the end all be all of God's revelation, I think Catholic apologists need to be careful not to completely undermine it without giving a, you know, a, a positive reason of, you know, that there's, there's something replace it like sacred tradition in the church. Otherwise, they can end up becoming uh, agnostics or atheists. Yes. I mean, we, the, the point in dialoguing or having conversations about the relationship of Scripture and tradition, and in particular refuting 
the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, is not to undermine scripture, but simply to put it within its proper context. That's all we're trying to do. I mean, we're concerned about truth here, right? And the truth of God's revelation. And so it's a matter of trying to situate scripture within its proper context in order that we may come to a fuller understanding of that which has been put down in writing for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the whole point, that we want to contextualize the written tradition handed down to us within the broader unwritten tradition, which we call sacred tradition, which has divine origin as well, and thus is binding on us as Christians. And so we look to both scripture and tradition, once again, for the sake of the telos, the purpose, the end go of having a full picture, the fullness of the picture of God's revelation so that we can see it clearly. Right. Yeah, beautifully put. Yeah, I think that's a common mistake with some Catholic apologists because I've actually ran into, you know, atheists who are former Protestants who uh, ran up to against arguments of sola scriptura, but the person kind of pulled a rug under scripture and, you know, in a sense, uh, yeah. demolished their faith. Yeah, I have a, I have one more thought as a follow up on that. Um I I do think there is there is a danger there. I it seems to me that if a Protestant comes to understand that sola scriptura is wrong, they could at least fall back. It's interesting for that particular individual, but I could imagine another individual who would at least fall back upon the truth, the historical veracity of these New Testament documents, mm -hmm. and recognize that these men who wrote these New Testament documents are followers or appointed by Jesus, and so have some sort of authority to speak on behalf of Jesus, right? right. And so I could at least rely on the historical veracity and follow what these early Christian leaders tell us to do as Christians and, and disciples of Jesus, although that individual would not be able to have the belief or the profession of faith that these books are inspired by God. They could claim them to be authoritative based upon the authority of Jesus as a historical person who claimed to be God, rose from the dead to vindicate that religious claim. And so they could follow them as authoritative documents, right? But they could not look to them as the inspired word of God. For if um, there is no infallible voice on this earth outside of the original 12, and these gentlemen who are writing these documents, right, to tell us which historical documents are inspired by God, then you have no infallible belief that these books are inspired by God. Because Jesus, nor those whom he appoints to speak on his behalf, ever tell us which Historical documents have God as the primary author, namely inspired. So you could follow them as authoritative and thus save yourself, I guess you could say, from uh, agnosticism or atheism, still be a Christian in the sense of following these teachings of the early Christians and taking them to be authoritative, but you could not look to them as the inspired word of God. And that's something that's very problematic for this Protestant doctrine of solar scriptura. Because think about this, Gary. If the Bible is the sole source to which we look in order to know what is God's revelation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then you would think that in order to have the belief, let's say Mark is inspired by God, well, then that belief would have to be found in the sole infallible rule of faith, namely the sacred scriptures. Right. But that's not – in the sole infallible rule of faith, namely the belief, Mark is inspired by God. And so therefore, according to the very principle of sola scriptura itself, a Christian would not be able to profess and believe, as coming from God, Mark is inspired by God. And then, of course, we could use the same line of reasoning for every other book in the Bible. And that's very problematic, because how can you follow the doctrine of sola scriptura if you have no grounds for which you can know what Scripture is, you see, and that's very right. problematic. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so in a sense, sola scriptura itself undermines the scriptura. Indeed, it does. If you follow <laughs> it to its, if, if you follow the principle to its logical conclusions, you end up having to deny sola scriptura because you can't even know what Scripture is. Yeah, very good.
Well, uh, let's well let's try to tackle uh, one verse. I think uh, this one's a very common one. It's Mark seven eight, which basically yeah. sa- says that uh, 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 Jesus cast the gates to these the scribes and Pharisees because they set aside God's commandment for the sake of your traditions or traditions of men. Right. And yeah. to say you Catholics, you violate Jesus's words by accepting this you know sacred tradition. Right. Yeah. If the challenge is no tradition whatsoever, right, well, then we could simply counter that and say, well, Jesus at least leaves open the possibility of some tradition, because notice the qualifier, your traditions of men is what nullifies the word of God. So that at least opens up the possibility that there may well be another kind of tradition, like a divine tradition, a tradition of God, or as we would say, a sacred tradition that is binding on Christians, right? Mm -hmm. So appealing to this passage in no way poses a threat to the Catholic belief because Jesus qualifies it as a tradition of men. And then further, as I articulate in this particular chapter in my book, Jesus is condemning a tradition of men that nullifies the word of God. So in particular, it's a tradition that's you know, contradicting sacred scripture. And we agree with that as Catholics. That's what my right. whole that's the premise of my whole book. If we're going to believe anything, it at least cannot contradict sacred scripture. So those are some initial steps that we can take in meeting that challenge. Is a qualification a tradition of men? Leave us open the possibility of a sacred tradition, and then it's a tradition that's nullifying God's word. So possibly there could be a sacred tradition that doesn't nullify God's word, and that is in harmony with it and something that Christians could follow. So that at least opens up uh, the landscape for us to begin tilling the ground, right? And so the next question is, well, is there any evidence that there is a sacred tradition that Christians are bound to follow. And I don't know how we're doing on time here if we're coming up on that break, but the answer is yes, there is evidence, and I'll let you determine when you want that evidence. <laughs> yeah, well, we have about 60 seconds, so... Uh... <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I'll just throw them out here, and then on the other side of the break, maybe we can come back to these passages. So, for example, you got Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. St. Paul says, Stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us either by word of mouth or by letter. So there we have an articulation of the two means by which traditions are handed down, through written forms and unwritten forms, in particular the apostolic preaching. And St. Paul is instructing the Thessalonians to hold fast to both in order to know what the gospel is, which is the context, and for the sake of preserving themselves from the religious deception of the man of lawlessness. That's what the whole chapter 2 of the Second Thessalonians is about. Hold, so we, has, we must hold fast to these traditions in order to protect ourselves from the re- religious deception of the man of lawlessness. And then when we come back on the other side of the break, I'll throw out another Bible passage from Second Thessalonians. Excellent. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I been informed by our engineer that there's some technical difficulties so our break's going to probably last a little longer than normal but stay tuned there's more to come with carl brassard when we come back you're listening to hands on apologetics
And you can go ahead, Gary. And welcome back to Hands on Apologetics. Sorry for that uh, long break, but uh, we had some technical problems. But nevertheless, we are talking with Carlo Brassard, and the book we're talking about is The Meeting, The Protestant Challenge, How to Answer 50 Biblical Objections to Catholic Beliefs. In fact, uh, Carlo, you know, I, I teach apologetics for middle school and high school kids on home No, Oh, awesome. So this is going to be the next textbook. I, I'm definitely going to put that for <laughs> on our curriculum. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, well, I mean, you do such a fantastic job w- uh, walking down these objections. And for those who uh, missed the first uh, segment, uh, we're talking about Mark 7, 8, where the scribes and Pharisees uh, are, are challenging Jesus. Jesus responds that you you put aside the commandment of God for the sake of you know these traditions of men. And, Carlo, you, you made some really great distinctions that... It's the traditions of men. He's not talking about the traditions of God. And he's also talking about only traditions that nullify the commandment of God. And then right before the break, uh, you went, I think, one of the most important counter verses Catholic apologists can use is 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where he says, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions which you have received, either by oral statement or letter of ours. So why don't you take it from there? Yeah, and before the break, I said I was going to throw out another passage. You know, I think even more, perhaps even more powerful, Gary, is Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. St. Paul says this, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the importance of the command. It's not an opinion that he's given, like when he gives his opinion about celibacy in 1 Corinthians 7, right? He's commanding them. He's invoking the name of Jesus. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's living in idleness and not in accord with the tradition, the Greek word paradosis there, the same Greek word that's used for tradition throughout the scriptures, including Mark 7, 8, that you received from us. So Paul's saying, hey, guys, in the name of Jesus, stay away from that brother who's living in idleness, not in accord with with the tradition that you've received. What is the implication? The implication is that as Christians, we must live in accord with the tradition that we've received from them. So, and he invokes the name of Jesus Christ to bind them in this matter. So we have explicit evidence from St. Paul exercising his apostolic authority, calling on the name of Jesus, binding the Thessalonians to live in accord with the has been handed down in written form, namely the scriptures. So that's a powerful text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, giving us clear evidence that we as Christians are bound by this sacred tradition received from the apostles. Yeah, very good. So uh, uh, so you, you would lay down those uh, two verses from Thessalonians. Uh, boy, that is powerful. So what would be a, a counter-challenge that a uh, Catholic could give? Would it be based on those verses? Yeah, well, the counter-challenge actually goes back. I mean, you, you could offer this counter-challenge. You know, how can we say that Jesus is condemning all traditions when Paul clearly exhorts Christians to follow traditions in his letter to the Thessalonians? in his second second letter to the Thessalonians. Or the counter-challenge that I offer at the end of my book gets back to the Mark 7, 8 verse, and it goes like this. This. You heard that? That was a little Cajun. This. (laughs) (laughs) This. I'm from southern Louisiana, so every once in a while it comes out, Gary. Uh, No problem. So here's a counter-challenge concerning Mark 7, 8. Does biblical condemnation of one kind of tradition require us to condemn all kinds of traditions. And of course, the answer is no, right? So, and this gets back to Mark 7, 8. Jesus is condemning a particular kind of tradition, a tradition of men, first and foremost, that nullifies the word of God. So there's two qualifiers there. And just because Jesus is condemning one form of tradition, that doesn't mean he's condemning 
all forms of tradition, right? And then you could – now a Protestant might push back and say, well, wait a minute, Carlo. There, the, 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 perhaps the point is not – that Jesus is condemning traditions, and therefore you Catholics are wrong. But what Jesus is doing is that he's showing a tradition must be judged according to the scriptures. We have to measure a tradition based on the scriptures and what God has revealed to us in the scriptures. And therefore, the scriptures are being used as the measuring rod you know, for us to determine uh, belief in the tradition and whether the, the tradition is good. Okay. But – and then this is true, but it doesn't follow from that that Scripture is all we need in order to know what to believe about God's revelation. It's simply underpinning what we already profess as Catholics, that whatever tradition we believe, whatever we profess to be coming from God, it at least cannot contradict that which God has given to us in the written form, namely the Scriptures, because God is the same author. God's, God's not going to contradict himself. So if God has told us something in Scripture, and then we're claiming that God is telling us something through the sacred tradition, the unwritten form of God's word, right? Well, then at least that which we're appealing to in the tradition cannot contradict what God has told us in the Scriptures, because God can't contradict himself. And we profess that as Catholics from the rooftops. We believe that 100 percent. In fact, that's why I wrote this book, Meeting the Protestant Challenge, to show that what we do profess as Catholics, even if not explicitly found in sacred scripture, does not contradict what God has given to us in sacred scripture. Yeah, that's great. In fact, it, it cuts both ways, doesn't it, Carlo? Because uh, if we have something that is handed on as divine and sacred tradition, we can't come up with an interpretation of Scripture that would con contradict that. Amen. And that's what we call the analogy of faith, right? That when, whenever we – this is a Catholic style of Bible study, you might say. Whenever we read Scriptures, we must read them within the heart of the sacred tradition. So as you mentioned, if we come up with an interpretation that contradicts what the church has handed down to us through the sacred tradition, then we know our interpretation is flawed. And in fact, this brings up, um, you know, Acts chapter 17, in when St. Paul goes to Thessalonica, and he's, you know, and he's preaching, then he goes to Berea, and he's preaching to the Bereans, and we're told that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and Paul's preaching there that Jesus is the Messiah, and then we're told that the Bereans appealed to the sacred scriptures. They searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was compatible with what was revealed, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a passage that I address in my book, and many Protestants will appeal to it, inferring from this narrative that scripture is our sole infallible rule of faith. But nothing could be further from the truth, because what if those Bereans searched those scriptures came up with an interpretation that contradicted what Paul was preaching, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Who should, we, who should they have gone with? Paul's preaching, that sacred tradition, or their own interpretation of the written form of God's word in the Old Testament? Of course, they would have had to go with Paul, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so we see there in Acts chapter 17, this, this principle that we hold to as Catholics that we must search the scriptures, amen, and study the scriptures, but we must interpret the scriptures in accord with what has been handed down through the apostolic preaching, namely the sacred tradition. Very good. We're chatting with Carlo Broussard on uh, Meeting the Protestant Challenge, a book by Catholic Answers Press. If you're into apologetics, folks, you got to pick it up. More on the other side of the break. You listen to Hands on Apologetics. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies. Featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Carstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. 
It all takes place March 14, 2020 at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today for Adoramus at the Triduum. Jesus said in Matthew 26, Stay awake and pray that you may not enter into temptation. According to St. Ephraim, Jesus, who feared nothing, experienced fear and asked to be freed from death, although he knew it was impossible. How much more must we persevere in prayer before temptation assails us, so that we may be freed when the test has come? May God grant that we may withstand temptation and carry out his will in all things. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. We are chatting with Master Apologist Carlo Broussard. And, uh, Carlo, you know, during the break, uh, our social media section of the Dojo Ask Question, they want to know about your website and whether or not you have a uh, YouTube channel that they could go to. Yeah, so my website is carlobroussard.com, and basically that's just a one-stop shop for all of the work that I do at Catholic Answers. Uh, because whenever my work goes live at Catholic Answers, we produce so much in the day. You know, what they put out of mine in like 15 minutes is going to be lost in the feed. So all of the work that I do, whether articles, audio, video, et cetera, is all in that one location at com. And, you know, I'm a little bit behind in updating it and stuff, constantly trying to uh, keep it updated. But the majority of my work is there. And as far as my uh, YouTube channel, I do have a YouTube channel that I used to be active on and upload uh, the videos. But they can basically get all of my videos uh, at the Catholic Answers YouTube channel. Uh, so all of the video clips from the Catholic Answers Live, all of the, my old ready reasons that I used to do, little two to three minute video segments, uh, they can get all that there. Beautiful. All right. Well, let me give you one more challenge. Uh this one's uh, is bandied about by some professional anti-Catholics in his Second Timothy three sixteen seventeen. So let me set it up for you. Second Timothy three sixteen seventeen says all Scripture is inspired by God and it's useful for teaching, refutation, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And they focus on see the the Word of God. Scripture makes you completely competent perfectly fitted out to do every good work so you really don't need sacred tradition all you need is yeah yeah notice the implied assumption they're looking to the end goal man being completed and perfect equipped for every good work but the implied assumption is that scripture is sufficient in order to achieve that end goal but if you look carefully at what St. Paul says, he says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the implied assumption here in the Protestant's appeal to this passage is false. This Scripture is not sufficient for achieving that end goal. The Scripture, according to Paul, is profitable, and the Greek word there is ophelimos, 
which literally means pertaining to a benefit to be derived from some object, event, or state, advantage, benefit, beneficial. There is an essential difference between the scripture being profitable to achieve that end goal of completion and perfected and equipped for every good work and the scripture being profitable to achieve that end. I think I said sufficient first, didn't I? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> but there's a difference between profitable and sufficiency. And what Paul is saying is that the Scripture is profitable, and we acknowledge that as Catholics. We say, amen, it's God's Word. I mean, God wouldn't have, wouldn't have given it to us if it didn't lead us toward that achieving that end goal. So it is profitable, but profitable doesn't mean sufficient. So here's an example. You know, Gary, uh, it's— it is, you know, a policeman. It's important that in order for a police officer to be a good police officer, equipped for being a great police officer on the street, he has to read the police officer manual. He's got to read the rule book, right? He's got to take the test at the academy and he's got to pass. All of those things lead toward him achieving that end goal of being a good police officer. But that doesn't mean. Taking the, making A's on the test and reading the rule book of a police officer – I don't know if there's some kind of handbook or something, right? That doesn't mean it's sufficient to achieve that end go. It's profitable, but that doesn't mean it's sufficient. Why? Because that police officer, in order to be a good police officer equipped for the good work of police officering, right, of being a police officer – He's going to have to get some street experience, right? He's going to have to get some experience on the street in in working with other police officers and taking down the criminals and to get that experiential knowledge. And that along with his intellectual knowledge will contribute to achieving the good of being a police officer. So sure, yeah. just because something is profitable, it doesn't follow it's sufficient. What is Paul saying? The scripture is profitable, a philomos. To achieve that end goal of being complete, perfect, and equipped for every good work. And that's that's even on the assumption that Paul is giving Timothy instruction concerning uh, the perfection of all Christians. As I point out in my, bu in my book, it, it, within context, one can make the argument that Paul is giving Timothy specific instructions as an ordained minister. Because notice he, he says that the scripture is profitable mm. that the man of God may be complete in these good works. Well, that phrase, man of God, Paul refers to Timothy as man of God in 1 Timothy 6.11. And so it's possible, as I argue, it's likely that Paul is giving instruction to Timothy in order to complete the good work of being an ordained minister, and he's saying the scriptures are profitable to that end. But regardless whether he's talking to Timothy specifically as an ordained minister or to us all as Christians, the same principle applies. The scripture is profitable, not sufficient. One last point, Gary. If this scripture passage is teaching solar scriptura, well, then we're going to have to say the Old Testament is sufficient. And thus, we don't need anything else in order to achieve the end goal of being equipped for every good work. Because the scriptures that Paul is referring to here within its literal historical context is the Old Testament. Because he tells Timothy, you know, um, and I think it's right there in verse 15. If you check out verse 15, he's telling Timothy to remember the scriptures that he was taught, right? The scriptures that he received, the scriptures continue in what you have learned. And know from whom you have learned it, how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So the sacred writings or the scriptures that Paul is referring to is the Old Testament. So if we're going to follow the Sola Scriptura uh, exegesis, principle of exegesis here, we're going to have to conclude that the Old Testament is all that Timothy needs in order to achieve the end goal of being completed, perfected, and equipped for every good work. But of course that's absurd. You see, so even so, no matter how we slice the pie here, the principle of exegesis that's underpinning the solar scriptura conclusion does not work. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, I never heard of the man of God distinction. That makes sense, though, uh, because yeah, does this apply only to Timothy or you know uh, our ministers like Timothy, or does it apply for everybody? But like you said, it doesn't matter really how you answer right. that question. It still just doesn't right. fly. 
Correct. So what would be a good counter challenge? Yeah, well, I suppose we could say if something is profitable for attaining a goal, does that mean that nothing else can be profitable or even necessary to attain it? And then, of course, the you know the answer is no. Just because something is profitable, it doesn't follow from that that there's nothing else that could be profitable or at least even necessary to attain the end goal that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's a big point. Even if it's necessary, like that's with right. The police analogy. Even if it's necessary that a good policeman uh, studies the manual, uh, it still doesn't follow that that alone is sufficient. That's right. You need some other things. I like to use the weight room analogy. You know, in order for me to be fit and healthy, you know, I can do those bicep curls all I want. But guess what? I'm going to have to get on that treadmill and run a little bit or on that bicycle and cycle a little bit in order to stay healthy. I'm going to have to eat right. I can't just be eating chocolate cake every day and lifting curls every day. It's not going to work. I got to have the whole package. Although every, each of those constituent parts of being a healthy human being is necessary neither one of those constituent parts are sufficient yeah very good in fact you know folks for those who are into the greek you know the greek words they use is for complete i've done a little bit of analysis on it and that's exactly what it means carlo it's all the necessary parts fit together in their proper order that's so right that's that's the sense of completeness that paul is talking about he's not making it just a single unit namely the scriptures Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And then, of course, we could always appeal to like other passages where, you know, um, where it, it where the scriptures does speak that we need other things in order to be complete as a, a Christian. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, in Ephesians chapter four, verse 13, uh, we're told that we need the church in order to be complete. In James one, four, we're told that we need patience. Uh, to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, right? Yeah, right. Uh, now, granted, the same the, the Greek word there in James one four is teleos, from which we get the word teleology, which means our end go. That's different than what's used in Second Timothy chapter three verse seventeen, but yet they s mean the same thing, achieving that end go and being completed and perfected. So, if we follow the principle of exegesis from Second Timothy three. And apply it to James 1 4, then we're going to have to say patience is sufficient in order to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But of course, that's absurd. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, what have you been up to? Are you writing any new books? Uh, you know, doing debates, uh, teaching? Yeah, actually, I am in the process of doing uh, research for a new book that I'm working on on purgatory. Awesome. So, yes, yeah, so the working title is Purgatory is for Real. Uh, God's uh, the joyful truth of God's purifying love. Nice. And so I'm doing research right now about to start writing that and I have to get that out. Uh, and We're going to try to publish it fall of 2020. Well, we're going to try to get that out through Catholic Answers Press. And I'm looking forward to it, man. It's a great study. I tell you what, man, the, you know, as on the surface. There's not too much concerning the doctrine of purgatory as far as magisterial defined teaching. Yeah. But when you start digging into the principles that undergird that dogmatic definition, it just opens up a vast, vast cavern of theological and philosophical truths that need to be uh, covered. And so in this book, I'm going to touch on some of that stuff. We're not going to go too deep because it's going to be a popular level book. But uh, we definitely will touch on it. And so we want to try to achieve two goals to show the truth of purgatory uh, from both the reason, scripture and tradition, as well as to articulate the joyful truths about purgatory and that it's something that's a manifestation not only of God's justice, but at the same time, God's mercy. So that's kind of the working thesis there. Yeah, beautiful. Well, I always found the proofreading process to be purgatorial in itself, so you'll experience it <laughs> before it gets hey, out. Man, I'll be offering it up for those holy souls, man. <laughs> there you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's Carl Broussard. Thank you so much, Carl, for coming on to the dojo. Hey, Gary, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And the book, ladies and gentlemen, is Meeting the Protestant Challenge. You can pick it up at Catholic Answers Press or Amazon or any great Catholic bookstore around your area. And uh, coming up next, we have I Impact Catholic Talk with the Terry and Jesse Show. And it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center, turn off the dojo lights. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope all of you have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody.
In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.